great time here. Um, and it's actually my first visit not only to Trieste and to Italy as well. So overall, a great experience. Uh, so uh, sort of, you know, in one or two sentences, like what uh, the general sort of long-term aim of my lab is to understand um, all of the steps from sensation to action, that is, uh, from the initial detection of sensory stimuli by receptor in on the sort of fly, uh, and on an animal's periphery, to all of the processing steps in the brain, and finally, sort of the biomechanics of the interaction of the environment uh, of the animal with the environment. Uh, so that's what we uh, hope to achieve in the long term, uh, and much of my lab's work is on flies. Uh, and one obvious reason is the fact that um, flies have uh, you know, the great genetic tools in the flies. Uh, but there are a couple of other important reasons, uh, maybe equally obvious to some, but I think want to articulate those. The first is the fact that although flies cannot read or write, they still have a large array of very interesting behaviors uh, that sort of resemble behaviors uh, of uh, larger animals. And underlying these behaviors uh, is a relatively simple brain. Uh, and there are two points that I want to make here. The first one is that uh, clearly compared to, a, say, a human brain, the fly brain is numerically much simpler. Uh, but an equally important point is that it's a still a substantial brain of, and has about 100,000 neurons. And uh, sort of when, we, when I decided to work on flies, one of the ideas was that a lot of the principles that emerge from a brain of this size are likely to translate to larger organisms. Uh, so, so that's, you know, that's uh, how uh, we think about uh, sort of the transformation from sensation to action and our choice of model system. Uh, now, in my talk today, I, I will focus on uh, just on locomotion. Uh, and what I want to emphasize, the thing I want to emphasize about locomotion that has already come up a few times uh, in this conference is the fact that you can think about locomotion on multiple spatial and temporal scales. Now, uh, at the most gross or uh, uh, large scale level, you can think of fly as a point object, sort of the Google map view of us. Uh, and where you can see the flies having either straight paths or taking these sharp turns uh, uh, in red, uh, straight paths in black. Now, if you zoom in, one realizes that uh, uh, that if you look at now the body orientation here uh, shown by this gray, the body orientation at many times in its trajectory is actually pointed almost perpendicular to the direction of movement, right? And so that adds in the idea of how, uh, how is the body orientation coordinated with the orientation of a track? And finally, uh, any movement, uh, any change in either the orientation of the body or its translation in space uh, has a concomitant interaction between the fly's legs and the environment, right? And so then you can add in the legs, and these yellow lines just demonstrate when one of its legs uh, st starts the stance phase, that is, where, when it touches the ground, right? And so so essentially, at that spatial scale, one has to understand sort of the physics of the interaction between the leg and the environment. And so, the, so in terms of understanding locomotion, so the basic questions that we are interested in is trying to understand the behavioral algorithms at these different spatial and temporal scales, how these algorithms are executed by neurons in the fly's nervous system, and sort of the role of mechanics uh, in uh, the fly's behavior. So these are the sorts of questions that we are interested in. And what I'm going to do uh, in today's talk is present sort of two projects. One is aimed 
at the flight point object, the other sort of the nuts and bolts of locomotion. All right, so let's start with the part one. And in this part, uh, what uh, uh, we have been studying for the last few years is to understand sort of the structure of locomotion in sort of a small arena and how odors affect the fly's movement uh, in this arena. Uh, and so the Um, the, so this is just a scanning EM of a fly's head, and you have the olfactory appendages, the antenna, and the maxillary palp. Uh, and uh, odors are detected when uh, the receptors present on these olfactory receptor neurons, or ORNs, are uh, they detect, they bind to odors, and that results in a change in firing rate or the rate of action potentials in these ORNs, and that's how odors are detected. Uh, and then these, the, the changes in activity is transmitted from the ORNs to the next layer in the brain, uh, and these principles of early uh, of odor encoding, what's called odor encoding, is is well understood in the flies, and I want to point out like two or three features of this. So uh, this is, this, in this schematic, these are the olfactory receptor neurons, or ORNs, that I was just talking about uh, in the antenna and the palp. Uh, and uh, each olfactory receptor neuron expresses a single member of a large family of receptors that not only decides uh, which order it will bind to, but where in the brain it will project to. All ORNs that have a given receptor project to a single region in the brain called a glomerulus, where it makes connection with the projection neuron, which are second order neurons. And a large class of projection neuron to project to a single glomerulus, sort of setting up a one-to-one -one connections, connection between ORNs and projection neuron. Uh, now, most odors uh, activate sort of a population of ORNs and therefore affect activity in population of glomeruli and a population of projection neuron. Now, different odors will activate a different but overlapping subset of ORNs. And so you can sort of conceptualize the odor encoding problem as, as each odor, in this case, say apple cider vinegar uh, being encoded by activity in a small set of ORN classes. Uh, so in this case, you have these seven ORN classes. The numbers indicate which receptor it expresses, which then labels which neurons, it, uh, you know, which neurons it, uh, are important for encoding, as well as which glomerulus and projection neuron. So you can set up a set up this problem, uh, uh, so, so that's how odors are encoded. So any given odor in the environment will activate some subset of uh, receptors, which is its signature. And uh, so, so, so when I started my lab, I think the, one of the problems that we were interested in is understanding the transformation between the set of ORNs activated and the resulting behavior. And to that end, we created this kind of arena where uh, the fly is basically walking in the circular arena. This is a side sort of schematic. Uh, and the, the, uh, the odor is uh, odor, either sort of fresh air or odorized air is coming from the top. And then you have vacuum at the bottom. The, uh, the whole point here is to create a region of a precise concentration of odor inside, in the, in the center of the arena. This annulus has no odor at all. So creating a precise boundary between uh, no odor region and an odor region. So here are uh, the tracks of the fly in this kind of arena. This is before the odor. In the presence of apple cider vinegar, which is an attractive odor, the fly spends much more time in the region where there's odor and then afterwards, uh, they scoot back and sort of hang out much more at the border. You can do this kind of experiment 
Okay. Oh, infrared just to visualize the fly. Thanks. Um, so the uh, you, uh, you can do these experiments on many flies, quantify how much time it spends inside uh, this region as a measure of attraction, right? Uh, and so uh, the sort of uh, the design principles here would be clear from a lot of the things that Ring mentioned in his talk. I think one of the things we wanted to do is have sort of manic control over stimulus. We know exactly where the stimulus is and how much it is. The second thing was also mentioned uh, by Ring uh, uh, is sort of the ideas from uh, Kennedy, uh, Kennedy's work back in the 70s, is that it's, it's, a wrong, uh, it's wrong to just focus on attraction. So we wanted to have a measure of attraction, but we also wanted to understand sort of underlying locomotion, how these odors is changing different locomotor parameters. Uh, as, uh, by using, uh, uh, sort of deriving those parameters from these tracks, right? And so uh, uh, when we did this e experiments, we quickly realized that there, the, that odors change many different aspects of the fly's behavior. Uh, and, uh, and those changes in behavior seem to be independent of each other. So, uh, uh, one fly could run slowly but not stop, uh, um, um, uh, run slowly but not turn much, uh, and so on. And so to capture this idea, we sort of created this, uh, what we call multidimensional behavior space. This is very brute, for, uh, brute force analysis based on simply parameters we thought were important and asked whether odors change those parameters. So we don't have to go this in great detail. But you know, the top row is uh, uh, all of the parameters that have to do with sort of distribution of the fly in the arena. The second row has to do with speed. The third row has to do with things that distribute fly, uh, how uh, flies locomotion distribute into runs and stops. Then final five parameters have to do with some aspect of turning. Uh, and what you see here is uh, how two different odors change these parameters. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the points that this kind of plot shows is that different odors, both of them quite attractive, uh, change different aspects of the fly's behavior. So some, one odor affects these two parameters, but the, but, uh, but the other odor does not. And these other uh, parameters in sort of magenta are affected by apple cider vinegar, but not by two butanol. So, so this, this kind of experiment and this kind of analytical framework gave us uh, a lot of insights, uh, such as the fact that many, these parameters are controlled independently, the fact that this control is dependent on the identity of the odor, and therefore the identity of the ORNs that are being stimulated by these odors. But there are obvious flaws uh, or limitations here. The uh, one is, Ad hoc, this ad hoc parameterization. So we have no way of knowing that there is no 18th parameter that is all important. Uh, and then, the if you if I gave you the 17 parameters, you can't take the 17 parameters and draw a trajectory of the fly to sort of encapsulate what the fly is doing. So there's no way to get from these parameters to a behavioral algorithm. And so what I'm going to show you next. Uh, is that uh, is our attempts at creating a generative model of behavior to get at the algorithm underlying sort of fly uh, uh, behavior and its response to odors. So what we'll do is measure parameters like here, but then create synthetic flies based on these parameters and compare how close the synthetic flies are to real flies or to empirical flies. Uh, and uh, because uh, in the interim from the time that we created the, uh, our arena uh, to when we decided to make this model, there was large progress in fly genetics. Uh, uh, one, of the, one of the big ones was the fact that uh, uh, the, uh, typically to activate fly neurons, 
using optogenetic methods like activating by light. People used a blue light sensitive channel. And then people discovered uh, or, uh, the red light sensitive uh, uh, channel rhodopsin, which is called crimson. And that made us po it possible to do behavioral experiments uh, because the flies cannot see red light. And so it was a clean way to activate neurons. So we also decided to update our, uh, our behavioral paradigm by replacing the odor now with light. Uh, the advantage, the, um, the 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 advantages of l using light instead of odor, is that the light, although we control our odor very well, light gives you just a little bit of better control and reliability from day to day. Uh, the other uh, importance and a, a bigger one is the fact that now you can essentially express the red light activated channels in sort of designer combinations of olfactory neurons. And therefore, you have much more control over which olfactory neurons that you're activating uh, that you would not have to the same extent with odor. All right, so that's the arena. And this plot just shows that, again, the red light is, is sort of limited here and then drops, uh, uh, drops dramatically outside uh, the center of the arena. So here is the behavior of a fly uh, showing that it can that there is a large change in behavior when you have this red light activated channel expressed in uh, a large set of ORN. So this orco, orco gel 4 is driving US crimson, where it's essentially driving uh, this red light activated channel in a large uh, number of ORNs. So the idea is that when the fly essentially is outside, sees uh, no light, and is inactivated uh, or, or not activated. And then when it goes inside, it gets activated. Uh, and it lights that activ activation in this case, and so sticks around in, uh, in the center of the arena. Now, so what we can, so, so, uh, what we can also do is essentially, uh, because we know the intensity of light as a function of space, and we know the tracks of the fly. We can create sort of the virtual uh, stimulus that this particular fly is experiencing. We can then replicate the same stimulus in the, an electrophysiological rig, uh, and then record from the ORNs in a different fly uh, in the electrophysiological rig, and you get sort of the ORN responses that corresponds to this kind of track, right? And so what we have in essence is uh, both the moment by moment account of behavior as well as its uh, neural, uh, neural responses. Uh, and so this, you know, this is just an example of how uh, this all looks. Uh, so what you have here is again the arena. The solid line is where the intensity of light is constant. And then gray line is where it gets to 10% of the intensity inside. Uh, and here you are seeing the ORN recording, uh, recording from the ORN. And these are the sort of sorted out spikes. Each sensilla, so these are sensillum recordings. Each sensilla has two neurons. So you're going to see two kinds of spikes. And in this, uh, I think you should be able to hear uh, some chirps. So those are, again, spikes. All right, so that, that's basically the data set. Uh, you have behaviors from, uh, 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 from a lot of animals. You have the, uh, the moment by moment uh, spike rates. Uh, and so now we will try to make sense of all of this. Uh, and I'll start by sort of talking about the, uh, uh, how, uh, about our generative model. So first we started with just modeling the fly's behavior before the light turns on. And that's shown here. It's just a simple model. Uh, uh, let's start with sort of uh, flies walking around. And uh, it's, it's quite noticeable that when, even when the fly is kind of walking straight, there is uh, a, a curvature to these paths. And those, that curvature is very important. Uh, and therefore, we model that as, as a curved walk. And from the curved walk, either it can then do a sharp turn 
or it can stop and turn, uh, or it can reach the boundary, and at the boundary we apply a boundary condition, because behavior at the boundary is quite different from at uh, the, the behavior at the center. And each of these uh, states can be modeled by you know, two or three parameters. Uh, and, and essentially what you, you can show, is, so that's the actual track and that's the model of this track. And you can see that uh, the model does a reasonable job of re recapitulating the behavior of the fly. And you can see that this is uh, the RMS error is of the order of the fly length, of a fly length. And so the bottom line is that, that this model, which is purely kinematic model, which assumes that all the fly is doing is choosing a speed and curvature uh, and walking with it or turning with it uh, and until it reaches the boundary. Uh, and there also, uh, its behavior is defi defined by speed, essentially, uh, can recapitulate sort of the behavior of the fly in the absence of the order. Now, the next question we ask, will this kinematic model work to describe the behavior of the fly? Go ahead. How does the model get every? Why is it so perfect? Yes. Yeah, why is it so perfect? Why is it so I mean, what? I think that uh, the, all the model is doing is uh, dividing the tracks into stops, turns, and, um, and uh, the curved walks. And uh, the, uh, there's no trick to it. I, I think I can tell you what basic insight it gives you, but that's all we are doing. And, and then we are saying that within each segment, what matters is average speed and average curvature. Uh, and that g gets you that close. Uh, and what it means is that the fly is going at the same speed and curvature over that track, and that's why it gives you a fairly good representation of the data. Yes, for uh, for each track, not for each point. So, at, at each point, is choosing uh, the duration uh, and the speed and curvature. So just so I understand, whenever there's a very sharp turn, you reset your model and say, okay, you've turned so much, now that's a new track, let's see if you can model yes, that. Yes, that's right, exactly. Uh, and so, all right, so that's, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, we can continue to discuss it later also. So uh, the, now next we ask whether the candidate we can explain a flight attraction. Now what that means is that uh, from sort of the 17 parameter study, we already know that odors change a lot of the kinematic parameters, such as run speed, run duration, like ev almost everything is changed by odor. And what we are basically going to ask is, are these changes sufficient to bring about the changes in distribution uh, of the fly, like spatial distribution of the fly? Uh, so what we do is, uh, so essentially you have uh, your, uh, your empirical flies, and uh, uh, we have we measure the kinematic parameters in absence of light, feed it to this generative model to create synthetic flies, uh, and then we have uh, we have ORN activation. When you activate the lights, we again measure the kinematic parameters, and again feed it to the generative model. This time we have tracks in the presence of odor, and uh, and this, you know, these are the red tracks. And what we are going to ask is, are the red tracks distribution uh, in space different from those of the green tracks? And uh, it turns out, so this, this is just examples. Uh, and you can see that uh, uh, one thing also to point out is that the reason we are showing two examples is to show that the empirical data is variable. Uh, the behavior of the fly, even when you have highly controlled stimulation, is variable. And there's some variability in the kinematic data as well. So these are just samples from the empirical data and kinematic model. And here is uh, one measure of uh, the distribution of the fly. And you can see by attraction index or 
the time that is spent inside the light zone. And you can see that the empirical flies are much more attracted than the, what the kinematic model fly. It's also important to note that kinematic changes in kinematics that we observe can also produce significant attraction, but that attraction is significantly less than that of the empirical flies. Uh, and this is another way to sort of look at this data. Uh, and what you can see is that the kinematic flies does not uh, recapitulate the distribution of the empirical flies, implying that we are clearly missing something. Although the kinematic model is a good model of the fly's behavior before the odors, it's not capturing some aspect of its behavior, right? And so what is missing was, uh, is quite apparent from this kind of tracks. And what you see is that uh, the flies, when they exit the, odors, uh, the light zone, they, uh, they have a tendency to turn sharply right after they exit the light zone. And this can be quantified by plotting what we call uh, decision density, which is the e extra number of sharp turns that the flies take right uh, at the odor border. And you can see that there's a large increase in those turns that matches sort of the gradient uh, uh, of the light. Uh, so, uh, so, so this kind of behavior is not being captured by the kinematic model. Moreover, uh, it turns out that, uh, all right, uh, first, uh, uh, this kind of behavior we will now capture with, uh, with a parameter that we call border choice, where we increase the chance of the turn to match sort of this distribution. Now, the, there is another phenomenon that occurs uh, uh, that uh, it's not easy to see here, but these turns are also biased. That is, a larger number of these turns tend to bring the fly inside the odor zone. And we capture this by creating a term called term, bi term bias, which essentially uh, asks, uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, compares the angle between the radial vector and the initial direction, and the radial vector, and the final direction after the turn. And uh, what if sort of theta 2 is less than theta 1, or final direction is less than theta 1, that means the fly is sort of going in an invert direction. And, uh, and that uh, gives you the turn bias. So uh, we, we, we will next model this idea by using these two parameters, border choice and turn bias, which we refer to as uh, decisional parameters. Not crazy about the name either, uh, but that's what we are going to call it. Um, uh, no, it turns out that the interesting feature in the empirical data is that the first two turns after the fly exits the arena or enters the arena is what turns out to be important. Uh, and that's shown here. So first for the uh, uh, sort of the, the decisional uh, for uh, the border choice, uh, if you look at the decision density for the first two turns, you see this peaked, peakedness. Uh, and particularly outside, after the first two turns, basically it returns back to baseline. And the same thing we observe in turn bias. The first two turns outside have a very large turn bias of almost 100%, close to 90%, uh, whereas the subsequent turns are at random. Right? So, so that's the feature of the empirical data of the border choice and turn bias that we are now going to put into the model. Uh, obviously, the before period remains the same. There's no change, and then in after ORN activation, we are saying that there are not only changes in kinematic parameter, but also decision, decisional parameters. And now see whether we can recapitulate the attraction. And the answer is that, yes, we can. Uh, uh, that the, if you look at both sort of the attraction index as well as the radial occupancy of the fly, the synthetic flies now recapitulate the behavior 
of the empirical flies, uh, implying that this seems to be at least a sufficient set of uh, uh, parameters to capture the behavior of the fly. Now, uh, the dis uh, we look further into sort of the me mechanism of the decisional parameters uh, to ask uh, what's causing the flies to turn right uh, after it exits the arena, uh, the light zone. Uh, and the first experiment we thought of is taking out one of the antenna because uh, of work in many insects uh, and in flies, as well as physiological work in the fly, showing that flies should be able to make inter-antennal comparisons. We decided to take out one antenna. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's the experiment. This is you know, one example fly. Uh, and this is sort of the distribution of the fly uh, when it has only one antenna compared to when it has both antennas. And at least at this level, it does not seem to be that the inter antenna uh, comparison is a dominant mechanism. So the next thing we uh, uh, wanted to ask is uh, uh, sort of more uh, empirically, why, why is, what is it? That, uh, that happens when the flies uh, to increase the rate of turns right outside the light zone. Uh, is it, uh, are the flies turning more per second? Uh, and that's shown here. And incredibly, it turns out that that's not the answer. If anything, uh, the, the sort of uh, time that it turns after uh, it leaves the, order zone, uh, the light zone uh, is, if anything, sort of larger in the flies with retina. So uh, I did explain this before. The control here is for these light activated channels to be active, you need to feed the fly with retina. So your orco, uh, the control flies are basically perfect. They have the same sort of genetic background, uh, but they don't have the retina, so they are not active. And you can see that. Uh, the, uh, the increased turning is not because of increased rate in turning. And it turns out that this is just sort of an illusion of the fact that the flies dramatically decrease their speed as they are uh, exiting the light zone. So essentially, as they're exiting the light zone, they're walking almost 50% slowly, if not more. Uh, they, uh, just because of that, they have a higher density of turn right at the border. And so that's the, uh, the biggest reason that they have this uh, increase uh, in turn density. Now, with respect to the turn bias, so next we look, sort of look at what's, what's happening with the turn bias. Uh, and we, uh, the, so again, uh, through a lot of other studies, uh, what, uh, what people have found is that the flies have, can have some idea of the environment. And so uh, and one of the ways to demonstrate that is as the flies exit the arena, uh, unless they're going straight normally out of the arena, there is a preferred direction of turn and a non-optimal optimal direction of turn and non-optimal direction of turn. And in other studies, people have found uh, that uh, uh, flies can take the optimal direction of turn, showing that they have some idea of, uh, of the shape of the arena. What we found, however, is that, uh, that, the, that it's by chance. The, the direction that they're turning is by chance. And so uh, here, the reason that we see such a pronounced turn bias turns out to be the fact that there's a large increase in the sharp angle of sharp turn. Uh, and so, so essentially, if you, this is the turn before, and this is the turn of the first two turns that demonstrate this massive bias. And the, the later turns, uh, although they are still higher, but they are much more closer to the baseline. And so, so essentially, um, the, to conclude this part, I mean, I think that the, the first point is, a kinetic, uh, sort of kinematic, you know, in a uniform arena, uh, 
where there's no stimulus, a kinematic mechanism does just fine to describe a fly's behavior. Now, in the presence of light, you have kinematic changes and you have decisional changes. Um, and, uh, and they together can describe, sort of describe the behavior of the fly. Furthermore, decisional changes uh, result from the simplest sort of mechanism, uh, I would say, one can think of. In fact, we didn't think of this mechanism. We thought of all of the mechanisms that would be more complex, that like osmotropotaxis or path integration kind of mechanism where you need to have some view of the environment. But really, the, uh, the mechanism is just slow down and turn hard, right? There's no, and it seems to be a very, very simple computation that the fly are doing here. Now, uh, so uh, the, we have, we, have, uh, we have done a lot of work at the neural end of this project that I'm not going to talk about today. And I'm very happy to talk about after the break. And at this point, sort of, I'm going to uh, turn to the second project, which uh, looks at sort of the nuts and bolts of locomotion. And here, what, we are going to, uh, what I'm going to talk about is sort of the f our attempts to understand the physics of the interaction of the fly with the substrate when the fly is uh, walking. Uh, and here, sort of our uh, ideas were influenced by sort of this long history of work that has shown that despite the complexity in the movement of individual limbs or individual joints within those limbs, the movement of the animal itself is relatively simple and can be captured by simple mechanical model. And here is sort of the, exam the, the sort of instantiation of that idea using fly. So what I'm showing here is the uh, joint position of the fly as it's walking from left, uh, from, from right to left. Uh, and you can see that they are fairly complex. Uh, if you look at the corresponding movement of a point on its body, on, on its thorax, which we use as a proxy of the center of mass, that motion is relatively simple. Uh, and, and so uh, what I'm going to talk uh, to, uh, for the rest of, our of, our talk, of my talk is our attempts to understand this, uh, uh, to, to get some simple mechanical model that will explain the fly's kinematics during forward locomotion. Uh, and so, so what, uh, uh, so this efforts can sort of divide into four, uh, four parts. The first is to, uh, to obtain sort of a high resolution account of the center of mass kinematics. So because the fly itself is very small, any changes in its center of mass mechanics uh, particularly that in the z dimension is quite small, and we need to be able to uh, resolve those changes to have any attempt, uh, any hope at getting a good mechanical model. So first thing we did was to measure center of mass kinematics at high spatial and temporal resolution. And then the next step is to how do you take this sort of continuous stream of center of mass kinematics and discretize into steps. Now, because the flies have six legs, and those legs are not synced up all the time. Uh, so that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, uh, poses some challenges. And so sort of the next step of what we did was to find some rational way of dividing the center of mass kinematics into tracks. Uh, and that, is, that question is sort of intimately related to question of interleg coordination, i.e. great. Uh, so, so that's step number two, and then we came up with a simple mechanical model that we are going to talk more about uh, later uh, that we think describes the center of mass kinematics quite well. And finally, we'll show that if you think of uh, a, fly, a walking fly as a point mass supported by three legs of its tripod, uh, that are, or three legs that are on its ground at any time, that springy tripod reduces to this AR slip model, right? Okay. So let's start with uh, the experimental data. Uh, it's just simple sort of small chamber where the fly is walking around. And we have a camera uh, that's looking both a side view as well as the reflected view through a mirror. Uh, 
And so that's sort of how the data looks. Uh, we can track both the movement of, the, of a point on his thorax as well as uh, uh, the stance legs, as the location of the stance legs uh, at, in each frame. Uh, and the important feature to notice here is are these sort of nice rhythmic bumps in the center of mass z dimension, showing that, and these are sort of step-to-step -step changes in the center of mass height, uh, showing that we can resolve the kinematics reasonably well to be able to fit uh, a mechanical model. Right? So that's the data. Now the next step is uh, to look at the gate. Um, in flies, uh, in particular, and other insect as well, what people say, uh, sort of current view is that tripod is the dominant gate at high speeds. Uh, and tripod is basically where you have these three legs, uh, two legs of one side and the middle leg of the other side. Uh, they move synchronously uh, and in opposition to uh, the, other, uh, the other three legs. So that's tripod, and then you have this tetrapod gate where the legs marked with these lines are the ones that move uh, uh, together. And they're sort of two versions of this tetrapod. And so to try to sort of tease out the gate that we see, the first thing we did was just plot the stance start times. That is the time at which each leg hits the ground on each step aligned to the first right leg hitting the ground. And that's shown here. Uh, and so that's the first right leg. So you know, that's, uh, that's what all of the rest of the data is aligned to. And what you can see is that the legs of one of the tripods generally come together, whereas the other tripod legs also come together, implying. Uh, and notice that this is organized according to increasing speed, and you don't see sort of wild changes as the speed increases, uh, implying strongly that a tripod gate is used across all speeds. Now, we did a lot of different analysis to sort of form up this conclusion. And one of the analysis, analysis is, was to come up with a new description of gate, uh, what, uh, what we call as the gate delay index. And what the gate delay index uh, is, is uh, uh, if you think of uh, uh, each leg cycling through stance and swing, then uh, the, uh, a gate is basically determined by the phase differences between these cycles. And, and so uh, if I show, so, so there are basically five, five delays that determine the gate. And just for convenience, let me show you uh, with these three delays. Uh, you can create a space uh, based on uh, this phase difference or delay vectors, uh, uh, delay, and then within the space, a given gate, like an ideal tripod, would be a vector. And then you can compute your experimental vector on a step-by-step -step basis, and you can ask whether which uh, how close to an ideal tripod uh, this experimental vector is. Uh, and here is the result of that kind of analysis. And uh, what you can see is, uh, and so what I'm plotting here is cos of that angle. So one meaning it's ideal tripod. Uh, and you can see that the, most of the steps are quite close to the tripod. And, uh, and there are no sort of steps that are hanging around what uh, the tetrapod, the two tetrapod lines. Uh, in fact, the real gate is what we call as either metachronal tripod, or you can just think of as modified tripod, where the three legs of the tripod are not putting, uh, are not uh, going into stance synchronously, but with a delay between the front leg. Uh, so front leg goes first, the middle leg goes next, and the, uh, and the hind leg goes last with a small phase delays. Uh, and so, so that's what we see as a gate, and then those delays sort of uh, become shorter and shorter as the flies become faster. Therefore, the gate uh, starts to become mo much more like pure tripod. So essentially, the conclusion is that um, the flies predominantly use a modified tripod gate, and that gives us a rationale for how to 
chunk up the data into steps. And this is shown here. Uh, and this is what uh, is referred to as gate map. The, 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 uh, the black areas are where the legs are in the stance phase. And what, you can, uh, uh, what we decided to define as the start of a step is the midpoint between when the last leg of the previous tripod leaves the ground and when the uh, uh, last leg of this tripod hits the ground. And that's, uh, that's what we decided to put as sort of the start of a step. Here are the speed and height now aligned to these steps. And you can clearly now see the pattern that there is an increase in speed around mid stands in most of the steps. There's also an increase in height, but that's less consistent. Uh, here is the data across uh, all the trials. I don't know why the error bars are not showing up. So there is an error bar here that's not showing up. Uh, it's a different shade of gray, I guess. Uh, but the conclusion is that the, uh, the speed changes. So there's a large increase in speed at mid stance. Uh, there's also an uh, increase in height, significant increase in height. But that increase is much, much smaller than what you see for changes in speed. Now, at this point, it's important to mention that uh, uh, this, uh, this is uh, uh, very different from what the well-known model for biomechanics in insect, the cockroach, does. That is, uh, cockroaches do just the opposite with the speed and uh, height both decrease to a minimum at mid-stance. Uh, but fly is not alone uh, here. Because stick insects uh, also show the same pattern as flies. Uh, it just turns out to be different from those of the cockroaches, uh, which, uh, which is the dominant model for biomechanics in insects. Uh, so next, we attempted to model this, uh, these kinematics, starting from what other people have done for cockroaches, uh, which is uh, that uh, there's tons and tons of studies that have modeled cockroach locomotion using, uh, the, using slip or spring-loaded inverted pendulum. Now, in, in slip, what you're doing is taking the three legs of a tripod and, and um, replacing them with this effective leg uh, that is a compliant leg uh, and can be modeled as a linear spring. Uh, and so the basic idea is quite simple. As the animal enters a stance, it's, some of its kinetic energy is used to compress the spring. Uh, and because it's losing kinetic energy, uh, kinetic, uh, kinetic energy it's, uh, it's going to reach a mid-stance minimum. And then in the second half, uh, that spring energy is being uh, released again and converted into kinetic energy, causing, again, an increase in speed. Therefore, you get a mid-stance minima. Now, it's, uh, it's uh, easy to see that slip, like, fundamentally won't be able to capture uh, the increase in uh, speed that we see in flies or stick insects, for that matter. Right? And so our first attempt at mechanical modeling was to take slip and tweak it. Uh, to get a scenario to, to insert a mechanism that will cause, uh, that can cause this uh, increase in kinetic energy. And the mechanism that we came up with was adding these so-called angular spring. And essentially, as the, as the fly now goes through its stance, so the stance begins on the left and, and goes like that, uh, as the fly goes through the stance, this angular spring release energy and increase uh, that can be converted into kinetic energy. Uh, kinetic energy. So let's look at this idea in a little more detail here. Uh, and essentially, the way we uh, uh, conceptualize this is by having, uh, when, the, when at mid stance, the angular springs are not doing anything. They're at their natural length. And then the Away from the mid-stance, these springs are always producing restorative forces to get the center of mass towards the, uh, uh, the mid-stance. 
uh, and the, as a result of which, during the first half, uh, the spring is going to accelerate the center of mass, and during the second half, it's going to decelerate the center of mass, resulting in a maxima of speed at mid stance. All right. So uh, here is the uh, here is our attempts to ch test whether this model will fit the data. It does a surprisingly good job. Uh, this is for one step. So this is the best fit of the data of this model to our kinematics data, uh, and this is all uh, over all of our steps in the data set. And you can see from the RMSE error, the model does a very good job of describing the kinematics. The upside of all of that is that you have uh, two spring constants, Ks and Ka, that can describe the fly's kinematics over a given step. Uh, and here, now, to use the language that Daniel introduced to us, this then turns out to be the template uh, for forward locomotion. So the next question we asked is, uh, can the flies actually produce this kind of restorative angular spring-like forces? And here, the answer turned out to be uh, surprisingly elegant, because it turns out that if you replace sort of the fly's body with a point mass, and these are the three legs of the tripod, and you think of them as linear springs, and take a sagittal plane projection of this, and we are basically modeling sagittal plane uh, kinematics, then the sagittal plane projection of the springy tripod under the conditions that there are not massive changes in R, uh, and there are and and the step length is limited to sort of low angle approximations. It turns into this AR slip model naturally. Uh, for, so the upside of all of that is for any springy tripod. So if you give me the flies uh, pose, all right, the, the battery has failed. Uh, if you give me the pose of the fly, uh, the position of the tripod. I can tell you the equivalent AR slip model. And so what can, we can do with this is we can ask the question, uh, if, uh, if the fly's uh, leg springs are uh, of constant, uh, uh, do not change much during forward location, that is, their spring constant does not change much, then we can ask the extent to which the changes in tripod geometry uh, recapture, recaptures sort of the kinematics of the fly. So the essential idea is for each step, you can, you have the tripod shape, and you can get the, you can estimate Ka and Ks by just crunching numbers, and you have your optimized Ka and Ks, and we're asking the question, uh, is the estimated Ka and Ks uh, similar to the optimized Ka and Ks, i.e., is the tripod geometry affecting the kinematics of the fly? And the answer is a very big yes, because you can see that, the, the, uh, that much of the variation in the center of mass kinematics actually results from the change in tripod geometry. So, uh, so, so all in all, we are very satisfied with this model and how it's actualized simply by the geometry of the fly's tripod. And now, not only this, it also turns out that uh, if you go to different parts of the Ka, Ks parameter space, you can generate both fly-like and cockroach-like kinematics, among other things. Uh, and so what we think is that uh, this AR slip model is an appropriate place to uh, start to look for a general model for insect locomotion. And with that, I will end, uh, and uh, you know, uh, with acknowledgments, these are the people whose work I talked about. Sanghe Jung uh, did the initial order behaviors. Uh, Liang Yu Tao and Siddhi Oyarkar did the optogenetic work, and Chen Wu Chun did all of the fly mechanics work in collaboration with our uh, physics, theoretical physics collaborator, Tito Vishwas. Thank you all for listening.